Hello, my name is Marlo Rencher, and I'm here to talk to you about radical inclusion in tech. So I'm about to pull up a slideshow. Perfect. So radical inclusion in tech is a really interesting subject to me. Um, but let me tell you first a little bit more about why I'm specifically interested in radical inclusion in tech. Um, I've been studying um, something around in technology, inclusion, and entrepreneurship for a very, very long time. I got my undergraduate degree from Michigan State University in Marketing. I got my MBA from the University of Michigan um, and my PhD in Business and Cultural Anthropology from Wayne State University. So, um, my focus at Wayne State University was really around um, the sociocultural aspects of the human side of entrepreneurship. Um, and since that time, I've really um, looked at it in three different ways. I've, um, I've been an entrepreneur, I've studied entrepreneurship, and I've also supported entrepreneurs by coaching them through a number of different organizations that I've been involved with. I've also spoken at South by Southwest, at Princeton University, and at TEDx in Detroit. Currently, I'm the director of technology-based programs at an organization called TechTown in Detroit. It's an economic development organization dedicated to helping to revitalize the city of Detroit um, through entrepreneurial programming. I'm also the founder of um, a business called Tech Founders Academy, and it's focused on helping black and brown women um, reinvent themselves as tech founders. Um, and last but not least, I'm a partner in Commune Ventures, which is an inclusive angel network. But that's not the half of it. Actually, I'd like to start really the conversation with why. Why is it that I'm so passionate about radical inclusion in tech? Um, and that starts out with my background. I was born in the city of Detroit um, in the 1980s. And one of the things that was very striking to me growing up was that there's a lot of devastation in our neighborhoods. Um, the commercial strips looked like they had had businesses in them at one time, but really were dilapidated. And I just wondered where all those businesses had gone. Um, it seemed like something that was missing. I had cousins and family in other cities and inside the neighborhoods, they had these businesses, but we did not. Um, so entrepreneurship was something that was really interesting to me when I first, um, went, since the time that I was a little kid. Also, um, I was really interested in technology. At that time, I had a love for computers, um, and so my parents got me a Commodore 64. I had the old Pong system, Atari 2600, all those things, and I was really enamored with technology and what it could do in the world. Unfortunately, many of the people that were the heroes of that time didn't look like me. You've heard of the, the Mark Andreessen's, the, the Bill Gates, um, Sean uh, Fanning of Napster, um, Bill, uh, Steve Jobs, um, heard about Facebook and Oracle and all these things, but I did not see myself in any of those stories. Um, and, but actually, entrepreneurship is something that um, is really a growth area specifically for black women. Um, so from 2007 to 2018 in the United States, um, 12 percent of there was a 12 percent growth in all businesses. And really, that was led by women owned businesses. But it was especially led by black women owned businesses because during that same time, it was 164 percent. Um, growth. Unfortunately, many of those businesses were not generating high revenues, not uh, operating at scale. Um, and I really recognize that for what really would make a difference in our community is if Black women um, had more access, had more interest, had more connection to creating tech-based businesses, creating businesses that had intellectual property, have scale, have more profitability so that they can get access. Um, and then ultimately, places like um, Detroit can have more employment, can fill in those uh, commercial strips and basically have a better quality of life. 
and I'm personally um, I'm personally dedicated to by the year 2030 to help um, some black and brown women founders to create unicorn companies or companies that were are valued at uh, one billion dollars or more. And so, as I said, I'm, I'm uh, a researcher, an anthropologist, and over time, I've been interested in figuring out, okay, how can we figure out how to make spaces that are, um, that are conducive to helping black and brown women and, and underrepresented founders in general. Um, so I did research, um, you, you hear a lot of statistics around the lack of diversity in tech. What I wanted to find out is what are those places and those spaces in tech, those co-working spaces, those um, conferences, the accelerators, incubators, what are the ones that are doing really, really well, and what can we learn for that? And so I went across the country, um, and I talked to a number of people um, and figured out, like, what's, what are the things that really, really work in, in terms of creating inclusive tech spaces? And this is what I found out. One big, um, the first big thing I found was community organizing. So part of um, creating the space means creating the space for a greater purpose. So as you're creating um, accelerators, incubators, um, conferences, it's important to talk about fulfilling a greater purpose. And that's part of why, um, you know, community organizing was a major part in creating this inclusive space. Also cultural signifying. Um, having art on the wall, having um, representations um, symbolically um, in, in photos and things like that, where people can see themselves in these spaces was also really, really important. Um, having that thoughtfulness and that care um, really makes a difference, um, especially when we're talking about co-working spaces where people feel uh, made, to, made to feel very welcome or made to feel not very welcome at all. So taking the time to understand the culture that you're reaching out to and making um, that culture impression. Um, this picture that I'm showing here was from Digital Undivided in, in Atlanta. And they had everything from um, pictures on the wall, books on the shelves, um, even clocks that represented um, major cities where there were a lot of African-American and Latinx um, people, just to show this understanding. And even they had Oprah um, wallpaper, which was really cool. Another thing to understand is that it's important to have a trauma-informed approach. And what I mean by that is that many underrepresented founders come to tech um, having experienced um, basically racism. Um, sometimes it's micro uh, microaggressions. It's you know, the little slights that over time build up to be a lot of stress. Sometimes it's overt racism. People um, really being um, persecuted um, from being in the space. And so just recognizing that people can come in with their own set of experiences that um, have informed them in a, in a negative set um, of basically a negative set of uh, experience that have informed their experience in being a founder, just understanding that people might have the trauma. Um, so choosing your words carefully is important. Creating safe spaces is important. Um, because basically people are always considered to be the other, underrepresented founders specifically always considered to be the other in technology spaces. So creating a safe space where they're not so othered is important. Also relevant representation is important. Um, making sure that as you're creating conferences, as you're creating incubators, accelerators, that the people that are in charge um, include um, the people that you're trying to reach out to. They include actual folks who are in underrepresented groups. Um, that's really, really important because otherwise it's really kind of lip service um, and, and seen as being a superficial um, gesture. Also critical race theory um, was another aspect of what I saw in the research. Just recognizing that people's um, relationship to race, racism, um, might be different from your own. 
Um, one example of that is that there's a theorist named Derek Bell. He was most um, known for being um, giving up his place at Harvard University because the school refused to um, allow any black women to get to tenure status. And one um, theory that he posited is that it might be the case that racism is permanent, that we're not necessarily trying to, it, that it might not take, um, the logical path might not be towards equality. The logical path might be towards creating alternative um, spaces and places, just understanding that um, all the momentum of racism, all the, the weight of it um, is more um, effort than some folks will be interested in bearing. And so not everybody's um, uh, interest is to be equal. Um, some people are and some people aren't, just recognizing that people have different perspectives about that um, and making sure that that's understood in the way that you create programming um, and in the way that you staff your programming and, and figure out what the goals are. So those are some of the things that, that I found in the research. Um, but going a step further, it's not really about this theory. It's really about how do you support underrepresented tech founders? How do you make more? How do you make sure that they're um, as supported as possible in a situation that frankly is not necessarily the most friendly? And so the best way to do it is to create these inclusive tech spaces. And I just want to briefly talk about five steps to creating inclusive tech space. And so the first step is assessing thoroughly the current state that you're in, um, doing it critically, doing it objectively, and if at all possible, finding someone from the outside with an objective view um, that can help you to assess your state and put it against some benchmarks, have you understand what's possible, um, and just be able to look at it with a different eye than perhaps you can put into the situation. Step two is creating safety. So what I mean by creating safety is um, there's a really good book uh, that talks about critical and crucial conversations. And one of the premises of the book, Crucial Conversations, is that you can really talk about anything as long as you're able to create a safe space in which to do it. And when we talk about safety, we're talking about making sure that people aren't, um, are, are, um, they, they can be free with what they're saying. Um, the the repercussion, repercussions and the consequences are going to be muted because we created some ground rules and um, created some expectations about what is going to be said. So creating safety is talking about, you know, we're going to talk about, let's say, racial issues. We're going to talk about how to create a space for um, underrepresented folks. And stating that out in the open um, allows people to understand that this is the kind of conversation that we can have. And it makes it much more safe to have those kind of conversations. It's also important to communicate your intentions widely. If you're in, in, interested in creating um, programs that are inclusive, you have to make sure that everybody is involved in that, that, um, in that process. Um, there are people within your organization that probably have a different perspective from you, especially the people who are in more customer and client and, and entrepreneur facing roles. So it's important for you to communicate widely and make sure that you're able to get a feedback loop that doesn't necessarily always include um, the usual suspects. Step four, after you've gone through, assess your current state, um, created some safety around having conversations about inclusion, communicated widely about those, um, the things that you're interested in doing, it's important to prioritize the implementation of what it is you're intending to do. Um, there are usually a lot of areas in which you can improve. And if you try to do all of the things all at the same time, you cannot be as effective as you need to be. So it's important to figure out which are the things that are the most um, important, which are the things that are gonna be the most urgent, and prioritize them in a way that makes sense. 
The final step is driving accountability. It is important that this is not um, necessarily just a, a, a effect that is created by committee. There has to be someone who is accountable, someone who is accountable and whose um, performance, whose um, review is tied to the results that they get, not just their actions, not just their effort, but actual results. So driving a, uh, accountability is really, really key in order to create inclusive spaces. So I really want to thank you for taking the time to talk about, um, talk with me about radical inclusion in tech. I invite you to um, connect with me on LinkedIn um, at linkedin.com. Um, Marlo Rencher is um, the username. I also invite you to check out Tech Founders Academy. It is um, a space where we're teaching folks, specifically black and brown women, around what is it to be a tech founder? What are some of the um, things that you need to know? Um, how can you become more confident walking in the space of and inventing yourself as a tech founder, assuming that the idea is right? Um, we want to just help folks get to that next level because a lot of times we're, when you're in um, this realm, everything out there tells you that this is not um, something that you should be. I mean, this is not something, some place that, that you belong. So Tech Founders Academy is really focused on making sure that people feel um, welcome wherever that they are, feel confident that, um, that they can be a tech founder too. So I invite you to connect with me um, at any of those things as well as um, at techtowndetroit.org. Thank you so much for your time and for your consideration.